fuel is kind of a big deal. For most trucking companies, it is their second largest expense behind driver wages. The average tractor on the road can haul up to 300 gallons of the stuff, and any upward movement on price can cost hundreds of dollars. Large trucking companies can negotiate rates, allowing them to turn a profit, while smaller carriers are forced to absorb the higher prices. This brings up important questions. If fuel costs carriers more at the pump, how much more will it cost us at the grocery store checkout line? Does the carrier risk raising rates, and how long will shippers absorb these rising costs? And finally, what does the future hold if costs continue to rise? We find out on this episode of Loaded and Rolling. This Loaded and Rolling episode was made possible by our sponsor, Emerge, focused on empowering and growing meaningful supply chain relationships. Emerge is proud to sponsor the Loaded and Rolling community through its freight procurement platform. Emerge offers solutions that enhance the spot and contract procurement process, enabling shippers to make the most strategic decisions possible. Learn more at www.emergemarket.com. Welcome to Loaded and Rolling. I'm your host, Thomas Watson. How did we get here? Fuel is the lifeblood of the modern economy. When prices go up, people take notice. This right here is, you know, even though that rejection rate is falling, this right here is what people need to be paying attention to. This is disgusting yeah. in terms of inflationary pressure. Inflationary pressures can be an understatement, as geopolitical events can have major impact on fuel prices. The more catastrophic effect is really when uh, oil prices spike and diesel prices spike because trucking companies depend on fuel surcharges. For many in trucking, that fuel surcharge is a major way to offset the rising cost at the pump. The only problem is it's not always legally binding to get reimbursed. What people need to understand is that there's nothing that guarantees that you're supposed to get that fuel surcharge passed on to you. Well, it turns out that the decline in fuel consumption from COVID created a situation where oil investment actually decreased. The, the reason why we haven't seen the investment flowing back into the oil patch is that in the U.S., you know, production was growing rapidly and all the earnings that, uh, that the oil production and, and was generating was being turned back into drilling more and increasing growth as opposed to returning the cash to the investors. Basically, during the shale oil boom, we just drilled for more shale and didn't reimburse investors. But now, since so many investors got burned with that price drop, uh, the requirements now that the financial sector has on drilling and investment in the upstream is merely to return the cash to the shareholders as opposed to invest in more drilling. Lack of returns means we don't currently have a quick solution domestically to meet the rising demand. So this begs the question. Impact is it having on trucking and the various commodities that trucking services as well as the global supply chain because there's commodities that are now not as prevalent as they once were prior to the Ukrainian uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Is there a breaking point? Here's an earlier clip from our next guest to set the stage. When you start getting to what I call the psychological breakpoint of pricing, which for diesel fuel is five dollars a gallon, and we're getting pretty close to it, uh, you begin to really impact people's business, uh, and it trickles down. Joining us now, one of the men you just heard from is Scott Burhang, director of Freight Waves Academy. Scott has been in the fuel business for nearly forty years as one of the original employees of Oil Price Information Services the leading provider of fuel price benchmarks. That's important because virtually every gallon of gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel that is bought or sold in the U.S. does so at some point on an OPIS price. Needless to say, this man knows his fuel. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure to have you on as well. I just played that clip recently, and, you know, when we're talking about it, like you mentioned earlier how we're a potential psychological breaking point and recent data mm -hmm. on track showed like five uh 519 a gallon in diesel and so the question really is you know 
What are some of the unforeseen consequences for trucking companies when it gets this high? Well, I mean, when fuel prices climb this high, it affects everything. It affects, it can affect supply. You know, as I said the other day, it's something to think about. You know, right now we're not in a supply situation, but demand for diesel fuel is really, really strong now that we're coming back from the pandemic. And uh, people are back out again and people are buying more stuff and the trucks are on the road. You know, when you have that type of price spike and that kind of volatility in the price band, which is what we've had over the last, you know, two weeks or so since this whole crisis started, um, it just ripples. It ripples throughout the entire thing. It affects it affects everything and it trickles down to the consumer, obviously. And many of these carriers, this may come as a shock for them because you don't really know it until you start looking at the end of the week or sometimes the end of the month. Like for many people catching up, we know about fuel for cars, but how significant is this increase in diesel? It's huge. It's huge. And it's huge not only on the large carriers that have, you know, that have a ton of asset, you know, they're asset based carriers with a ton of vehicles. Uh, It affects them. You know, their buying strategies are a little bit different. So when this kind of volatility in the market kicks in, they oftentimes have backup plans on on how to mitigate this. And one of the ways to do that is is to hedge their fuel. Um, But when you trickle down and you get down to the smaller owner operators that, you know, truly have two, five or 10 trucks, you know, they don't have that flexibility in being able to do that. So right off the bat, they have to go and they have to recoup that money. So it's it's devastating. It's devastating and it happens quickly. And what this to me really illustrates is how quickly these markets go from being somewhat flat to being incredibly volatile, incredibly volatile. And that's where we're at right now. Um, the trading bands, when you talk, I have a lot of friends that are in the trading groups that buy physical fuel or people that buy futures and hedge and the bands and the fluctuate bands, meaning the fluctuation in prices is astronomical. There was a dollar 30 swing last week in futures. So it's, 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 it just goes to show how these markets can change on a dime. And they're very, very psychologically impacted by what's happening overseas. I like what you're talking about with hedging. And it's almost like Mm -hmm. you said, you know, carriers are now having to go to like a plan B. Um, Could you explain a little bit? Because I know that when I worked at a large carrier, we had a fuel desk. We went to certain truck stops. But what does it look like when the carrier Mm -hmm. sees this? What are some of the tools they can use to try and hedge it or offset it? Well, that's a great question. So, you know, there's, there's two pieces to a fuel buying program, right? There's the there's the physical side of it. So if you you leverage your volumes and you get a better deal on your cost plus, so that can save you some money there. Or you have the the you have the you have the hedging side of it. So what carriers can do is really look at this entire situation and and say to themselves, I need to align myself with a really good broker who understands these markets. And we really need to come up with a corporate hedging strategy. So as you're physically, if you do it right, and if you do it with someone that you have a lot of confidence in, as you hedge, what you're doing is you're offsetting the gains in your physical price. And that's offset by money that flows into your commodities account. So at the end of the day, you're somewhat breaking even. Does that make sense? Yeah, it kind of looks like you almost have to if I'm recalling this correctly, you almost have to sit down at the beginning of either your fiscal year or something and say, hey, look, we expect to spend this much in fuel. And then what you're saying with a hedging strategy is now we go to the second dimension where it says, well, what if fuel goes up this much? We should buy some particular commodities hedges. So that way, if it goes from $4 a gallon to $5, we're going to sell these options or future these contracts, and we're going to have a little bit of money to help fill in the the difference, right? That's exactly what it is. So again, I think what this really speaks to is 
the fact that you have to go back every year and look at both sides of this. Okay. I need to look at my physical side, like the actual fuel that I buy. Okay. I need to do that. I need to see, have my volumes grown? You know, what kind of leverage do I have? Is there a way for me to go to my supplier and try to get a better deal on my physical fuel? That's the first piece of it. The second piece of it is exactly what you just said. Sit down as a company and decide what your strategy needs to be and and be smart enough and be fleet of foot enough to know that when something comes along, like what's happening now uh, with the volatility caused by what's going on in the Ukraine, um, be able to pull the trigger and work work closely with a broker that you have a lot of a lot of trust in and that you feel comfortable with because it is I, I was having dinner the other night with a friend of mine who is a futures trader and she was saying to me that just in the last week they've had margin calls on futures in in essence in in excess of two three million dollars so there's a financial commitment on the company's part when you decide to hedge. But, you know, people always said it in my almost 40 years of doing this, and I taught fuel buying classes, people would go, well, you know, hedging, I don't want to do it. Hedging is speculating. And what what I would always say to them is not hedging is speculating. You really need to think about it, especially if you are a large, large fleet with a lot of exposure. Look at both sides, look at your physical side and go back and look at, at, at whether you have a hedging program and does it need to be tweaked? You know, you made the, the suggestion, Thomas, of the fuel desk. You know, I talked to a lot of people over the years that have fuel desks. And a lot of times what happens is they rotate people out of those fuel desks. Right. So they'll they'll keep them there for one or two years and they move them out and then they'll put somebody in there that maybe the last commodity that they bought for the company was, I don't know, paper cups or they bought coffee or something that is not a volatile commodity. And then all of a sudden they hand them what we used to call it Opus, the the book, right? It's the list of suppliers. It's the list of terminals. And that changes all the time, as does your, your what we call rateability. So how much fuel do you buy? So it's very it's very important to look at both sides of it. I think that's a really cool thing because when I thought about the fuel desk, I always thought it was somebody giving drivers directions to a fuel stop. And if you do it the right way, it literally is a way for the company to avoid riding the rails. And so not only are you looking at your fuel spend, but these big guys could theoretically, with the help of a broker, they could navigate the market and they're basically protecting themselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know... (laughs) Markets, fuel markets are, are, they change all the time, right? There's a, there are specified number of terminals in the U.S., right? So there's about 400 terminals where fuel is stored, okay? That's pretty static. That kind of stays the same. But what changes are the suppliers. And especially when you get down from the integrated refiners like the Exxons and the Shells and these guys, and you get into the distributor world. And distributors are basically oil companies without a refinery, and they're the lifeblood of supply in the United States. So what's happening in that sector is there's a lot of consolidation, a lot of change, a lot of a lot of different people involved and in companies that are in certain markets and not. So that's why really going back and always making sure that you pay attention to the physical side is is so important too. And and here's another thing, go look at contracts, right? Because if a lot of contracts have what we call overlifting or underlifting penalties. So if you just say I'm not going to buy fuel, you could get hit with with an underlifting penalty whereas if your demand starts to go up and you pull more than you're supposed to, you could not only be looking at considerably higher prices, but you could be looking at considerable overlifting penalties as well. So it it is super important to look at the physical side. And then it's also important to sit down with a broker. You know, this business, the fuel business is about relationships, right? It's not like buying, it's not like buying some of the stuff you can buy on the internet where you don't need a uh, you don't have to have human contact this is a huge spend it's very sensitive people get upset about this stuff when you look at and just look at what's happened in the last two weeks when you look at a bump up in price like this 
people that have to buy fuel or the fuel supply people for fleets or whoever it is, this is, this is, you know, it's, it's a real nail biter. You don't know where it's going to go. So it's very, very important. It's real important to look at this stuff. And I think what's so crazy is, we you know, we've just talked about how the largest fleets with millions of gallons in spend, they have all of these levers they can pull via not only, you know, uh, contracts, uh, future speculation, as well as their relationships. Let's, let's zoom in, sw- shifting gears, looking at the smaller carriers. Let's say I have five trucks. Uh, what's the situation for me? Because I feel like I can't afford a fuel manager and half the time I'm just happy if the card works. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's that, you know, you don't have that structure. You don't have the internal person that's buying your fuel for you. So you're probably just, you may be fueling over the road. You know, are you using, um, are you using a credit card that gives you some type of cost plus pricing where at the end of the day, by aligning yourself with that credit card company, you're paying somewhat less than the pump price? I mean, when you have price increases like this, every little bit helps. So if it's three cents, four cents, five cents, um, you know, that that can help. You're never too small to hedge. You're never too small to hedge. Now, you may go to a large bank. You may go to places like that that'll say, no, you're too small. We don't we don't work with customers like that. But there are smaller brokers out there that will work with you. And I can help anybody here that's looking for that. Um, but there there are ways that you can do it. You But rateability to me is the thing that I think people don't know the answer to. Like I, in the course of teaching my classes for all those years, when people would come to the class, I'd go around the room and I would say to them, okay, you're here, you're here to learn about fuel buying. How much, how much fuel do you buy a year? And half the room would get, would, would be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no clue. I don't know how much I buy. So that is an important number and look at it over time. So if you're that small guy Look at how you're buying your fuel. You know, are you buying it over the road? It may be that you want to have it delivered. Maybe there's other ways you can do it, but it's all about rateability. So when you go to somebody and try to come up with a better way to buy fuel, the first thing they're going to ask you is how much fuel do you consume a year? That's a hard question for a CEO. Like, you know, if you're, if you have five to 10 trucks and you're being asked, how much do I consume? A lot of times you're so busy, you don't have time. You're kind of like, uh, let me see, how many, we have 300, let me get my beer math here. Uh, it is 300 gallons of fuel per tank, and then you have to look at how much in a week did I spend, then you multiply it, and then it's almost like you said, the situation where nobody thinks about it until you need it, and by then it's too late, correct? Yeah, so there are ways that you can get your arms around that if you're that guy that has you know, I, I'm doing 50 different things in my company. You know, I may be driving the truck. You know, not only am I procuring the fuel, but I'm driving the truck. I'm doing the hiring. I'm doing the firing. You know, I'm doing, I'm doing all this stuff. There is software out there. And a lot of the software is falls under the umbrella of what we call Best Buy, right? So there's ways to have your fuel spend, the, the amount of fuel that you consume, the amount of money that you, you pay for it. There's a way to have that pushed into software and give you back reports so you can stay on top of it. Now, it, it is a fundamental expense that you have to have for your company. But if anything that the last couple of weeks has taught us, again, this stuff can flip on a dime. So being complacent is not the way to go. If your business is small, there are ways that you can get your arms around controlling your costs and knowing where, where it's going. You know, do you... Do you put optimizers in your trucks? Do you do you have an optimization system that's going to direct the truck where you want to go because you have an alliance with a card company? So, you know, it, it is complicated. And, I you know, I tell people there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is you have to do the homework. The good news is once you do the homework, you probably don't have to do it again. So the people who were really smart in this, and you know, it's funny, we were literally just talking about this the other night, as I said, when we we're talking about these crazy margin calls, you know, one of the things that we said was it's really interesting. The people who are going to survive this and do okay were people who had planned for this and they've been through it before. And they didn't just assume that 
this market is always going to be flat. Yeah, you did you did your homework. It's almost like the further you buy out some of these contracts, the less you'll have to pay sometimes for it. And then if you thought about it in advance from like an actual strategy, you could then say, not only could I potentially offset it, but I may be able to make a little bit afterwards because I know my cost. I know I just upgraded my trucks. And that's the, that's the kind of other thought. With the fuel surcharge, a lot of times, larger carriers will make money off of it. Um, let's say, I think, if I'm correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like six miles per gallon for a truck. A new one can be eight to nine. And so when you get the kickback from the fuel surcharge difference, some carriers are actually making a cent or two per mile. They might be. They could be. They could be. Fuel charge surcharges are one of the black holes, I think, for people because they don't, they're not spelled out. They don't understand what the basis is for the fuel surcharge. How are they calculating it? A lot of times they just automatically go off of the DOE number instead of using a localized number. You know, DOE numbers have some inherent problems with them, and a lot of fuel surcharges are tied to those. So if you have a fuel surcharge, look, it goes back to anything else. Ask questions, right? It's a huge spend. So if somebody's putting in fuel surcharges, you want to ask the question about it. You want to understand how that fuel surcharge is being calculated. And I kind of like that. So we're thinking, we've talked about fuel hedging. We've talked about some of the changes with technology. Um, you know, options now. So let's look at the immediate term first. What are some immediate mm. options I can do right now? Let's say I'm not prepared. Is there anything I can do immediately to stem it? Or should I have thought about this like six months ago? Well, you should have thought about this a while ago. I mean, the problem right now is there's just an incredible amount of uncertainty over what's going to happen in the short term, right? So if this, if this situation is resolved, if there's a ceasefire, you could see prices correct down, okay? They will correct down at some point. They absolutely will. But the, the question is, when is that correction going to happen? Is it going to happen in a week? If there's no ceasefire, is this thing going to go on for another six weeks? I mean, it could go on for a while. I mean, what you can do at this point is begin to put your ducks in a row so that this doesn't happen to you again. Right. So get your arms around how much fuel you buy, how much you spend. That's your rateability. Right. So rateability is the number. That's the number that you're going to have when you go to talk to people. Begin to think internally with your company. Now, if it's a super small company, if it's a small trucking firm, you know, it might just be yourself or it might be yourself and somebody else. But as a corporation, you should sit down and you should decide what, if any, hedging goals you're going to have. OK, the one thing you never want to do is hedge alone. You want to make sure there's people that are buying into the plan. OK, then begin to investigate. And if some of your folks are looking for people, they're welcome to reach out to me. I can help them. Um, now is the time to really begin thinking about how to protect yourself from this kind of volatility. Now, you may have trouble getting part of the problem you're going to have right now is that options and everything are very expensive. You have to put up margins. So you're kind of in it, and it may be tough at this point to try to put in a hedging program that's not going to cost you a lot of money. But again, it doesn't hurt to try, and it's a good thing to do to think about when the next blip comes in the market. Because one thing I've learned in 40 years of tracking these markets, these markets change on a dime. And even though you start to get lulled into a false sense of security, like I think a lot of people were, that the markets are flat or they're coming off, you know, you're coming out of a situation that has a lot of troubling fundamentals, right? You're coming out of a pandemic. There's more and more people taking to the road. Demand is up. Prices are up. And you have an, an aging infrastructure. So if, heaven forbid, there's some type of major problem in this infrastructure, like a pipeline, like we saw last year when the Colonial Pipeline went down. That's the largest products carrier in the United States. If that something like that were to happen, or we have some type of weather event in the Gulf Coast that causes three or four refineries to go down, it, it's, it's incredibly unpredictable what could happen. So look at your fuel spend, get your arms around it, begin to put some people in your company on it, figure it out. And like I said, if any of your folks have any questions, they're more than welcome to reach out to me and I'm happy to help them.
And I, I appreciate that. Also, worth plugging, right? We have the Freight Waves Fuel Buying with Academy coming up. Uh, is there a way people can you check do. that out? Yes. So we're very excited about this. We are uh, rolling out Freight Waves Academy a, probably in the next six weeks. And the first course that's going to be available is my best practices in fuel buying. Well, it's very exciting. Sure. I'm going to get him. Uh, I'm going to point him in that right direction because uh, definitely check you out on Please LinkedIn as well as Freight Waves Academy. Uh, so that way we can actually get prepared, come up with those strategies, and try to not have it happen yes. again. And again, I'm happy to. One of the things that I've always enjoyed doing in my career. Is I got to. I got to let you go on this one, but I wanted to yeah. thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to have you back over. So we're going to we're going to do it live next week. Definitely follow us, like, and subscribe.